And creativity is a critical part of solving the, the mess that we found ourselves in right now. It's, you know, I have kind of a thesis that the business world stole the word creativity and repackaged it as innovation because it's more fundable. And yet as all these different uh, music classes and arts classes are being cut, like we're, we're going to like lose creativity. And if we lose creativity, there's no more new ideas. We're stuck with everything that's already in a textbook and there's no more progress. There's no more uh, solving of the problems that we've found ourselves in, which requires creative thinking. Yaro Craner is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Yaro is the founder of Hatch and H360.ai, is an Aspen Institute Fellow, RSA Fellow, and named 2015 Top 100 Creatives in the United States by Origins. He's directed projects with Richard Branson, The Rock, P. Diddy, and more. He is a pioneer of social networking and has been building communities for 20 plus years. In 1999, Yarrow created an online network the Hero Project, which grew to 1.5 million users and was acquired by Fox. In 2004, Yarrow founded Hatch, connecting global influencers to accelerate solutions for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. In 2016, Yarrow founded H360 AI, a machine learning impact collaboration platform H360 connects people to resources and unlocks the potential of communities and organizations powering a network of networks. Yaro is featured in the book, Talent for Humanity, was honored with the Oddfest Impact Award in 2019 and has led think tanks with Intel, Hasbro, Ernst & Young, NASA, spoken at TEDx, VivaTech, EarthX, Day One, and Business Innovation Factory Sub Summit. I could go on and on because he's been at it for a long time. He has a long list of accolades and acc accreditations. I would like to tickle the surface just a little bit more before we jump into our conversation about uh, some information that I have on Hatch and, and to maybe understand more what this beautiful thing is that he's created. Hatch is a nonprofit ecosystem that consists of two annual summits, year round mentorship programs, and a global network that connects to accelerate solutions for positive impact. They just finished uh, one of their 24th cohorts Hatch is not a place of ideas. It's a chemistry set of diverse individuals, industries, and expertise, collaborators who cross pollinate to accelerate solutions for positive impact and hatch a better world, a better earth. The hope is that 150 curated guests will impact the lives of 100 million people around the world. The topics of discussion and focus feel like a heat map of what's keeping people up at night. Climate change, education, gender and race equity, freedom and fairness, the integrity of democracy, creativity, and critical problem solving tools, and much, much more. It is not just a discussion. There are real projects with real people and real big impact born all from Hatch. I'll leave it at that because uh, we're limited on time and I really want to get to my special guest. Yaro, thank you so much for being here and bearing with me on that long introduction. How are you? Oh, Mark, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. I'm uh, doing fairly well considering a global pandemic, you know, just navigating the high seas with blindfold on. Yes, um, that is my first question. How have you weathered this pandemic? So 
I, I know a little bit more and we'll get into it about your, your biography and your life. You've, you've had a lot of things that have taught you resilience and made you a wonderful human being. Um, has any of that helped you weather this pandemic more in the things that Hatch has done for humanity and along with many wonderful partners? Has that resilience or those learnings helped you get through this time any better uh, at all? And how have you been? How have you weathered it? Um, absolutely. I, I, I do believe that I've been um, uh, tuned up a bit for change and unexpected things and chaos and so forth. And so when this happened, uh, just even through my childhood and, and with, uh, but through, when this happened, you know, when things really started getting real kind of stateside uh, in March, uh, there was a, there was a couple days where I was really a kind of oxygen mask on myself. I was like, wow, every single revenue stream that we have has been eviscerated. Uh, what does this mean for us, for Hatch, for the future? And then I just had this kind of sudden realization that, of course, everyone's feeling the same, the same sort of questioning. And so we kind of very spontaneously did a pop-up called the Global Living Room, where we invited all of our guests who have been through Hatch alumni over the last 17 years, 24 summits. And the first time watching all of these faces appear and melt on the screen from Turkey and France and Germany and Hong Kong, it was just like Germany you know, LA, New York, Montana, it was just beautiful to see. It brought like tears to my eyes. It brought tears to like many people's eyes. And there was a kind of an aha moment that like, wow, I can't believe that we've not done this before. And all of these people that should know each other that aren't necessarily cross pollinating. And, and it's turned into a real interesting series of discussions and, and, and then into action circles. And then we launched something called the Impact Labs, which we just wrapped last week. And um, we also opened up the, you know, rather than just creating an invitation for only Hatch and alumni of Hatch, uh, about the third week, I just realized these conversations were so valuable that we should just put a global invite out. And now's not the time for any sort of segregation, but it's one, you know, one global community. So we just opened up the invitation and people have been coming uh, weekly to these global living rooms. And then, and then the impact labs and we had, 150 impacters from around the world, 12 countries, 34 states across the US, wow. um, coming together to form 20 teams on four topic areas. And that was a seven week rapid ideation design sprint on, on 20 projects in those four areas, which were the future of education, equity and racial justice, the environment and climate change and mobilizing the vote. So that, that was an interesting experiment that, that has uh, panned out really promisingly so i'm glad to hear that um personally you're you're okay you're doing all right you pivoted all right you've made it fine yeah I, you know i have to say i feel blessed to be a surrounded by nature i live in montana now where i originally grew up after and went to nine years in los angeles and came back so montana really fuels my soul and there's a lot of space and you know just natural organic elements uh, and, and second, I, you know, I feel really grateful to have such an amazing community of people that inspire me and really keep me upright. I think that we all kind of um, plug into each other to, to support each other and, and really, you know, collectively give each other strength. That's fabulous. I'm, I'm glad to hear. For our listeners, we very first met at Kinternet and um, in, close to Venice at H Farm for an event and I'm, I'm so sad that we didn't get more time to talk. I, I think we got a couple selfies or photos together and, and we exchanged a little bit. Um, but that was my first experience with, with you live and, and I uh, uh, since and, and before met others who've attended the Hatch events. I haven't been, had, had the honor to do so or be part of the network, but nothing but positive wonderful love resonance people who are educated their life changed the impacts that they were able to give to to others are just amazing so um not having experience in myself all i can say is wow i i, I feel left out now that uh, <laughs> because uh, and, and just all the amazing things that you've done 
uh, with Hatch and, and how that's experienced. Be it. But it was, and it is, a, a physical event until this global living room. And so that lockdown, that, that process, I could tell, is, uh, can be obviously something of devastation that you're in all. How, how do we keep this, uh, this community uh, together and how do we grow that if we can't uh, come together? And so there's, that, that is something that's very difficult because I, I, what I've also kind of gleaned out of all the information and the comments from other friends that, that mutually know each other is that there's always this connection to nature. There's always in, in the experiences, it's this connection to nature, to breathing, to one another, a lot of conversations, a lot of discovery and uh, as well as projects and impacts that come out of that. And so I, I, I imagine that's a hard thing now to transmit through the digital always. And, you know, it's a, it's a little bit different. Um, you, you're, and I got a question here, I promise. Your human zoo in, in, in Montana that you've created is probably pretty nice. But what a lot of uh, uh, people, not just in America, but around the world are finding in this lockdown and in this pandemic is that the human zoos we've created or that we're forced to live in because our means are at a certain level are not that always that great or haven't been designed in a way that they're great for a lockdown situation. They don't uh, give us the opportunity to get out into nature. And now we're seeing them much closer and we're realizing, boy, I've made a mistake because this isn't a place I wanna be 24 seven for weeks at end, for months at end, you know. Um, I, I had a guest who's also a kindernet, David um, uh, uh, Barrett, uh, Tomas David Barrett, and we talked about this human zoos, and he does a podcast and a show called Human Beast. With this connection to nature, with Hatch and the experiences that you, you, you get, um, I hear that it was all created and developed over time through your experiences of, uh, of life, from what you experience with your, your parents, your mother and father, your mother being the prime example to, for your life and moving and, and, and all those that have shaped you to this point in time to be really in tune with nature, our world and other human beings and to see them in a different light. That's why I asked you that question of, how have you weathered the pandemic? Is there some resilience and, and how it was a be? So, so I really thank you for that answer. But that leads me into my first question is, do you feel like you're a global citizen? And what would you feel like or react to a world without divisions, nations, borders, or this distance from one another as human beings? Well, yes, Mark. I, I mean, I, I, I am definitely a global citizen. Uh, Buckminster Fuller was the first to coin the term spaceship Earth. And I remember feeling so proud at COP21 in Paris, which was the very first time that we had a leader from every single country present. And I was there as well with a group called Earth of Paris. And just recognizing that we all share this living room together, that the pollution that happens on one side of the planet makes its way around the whole planet. And it was a really proud moment. I think that we've kind of, you know, gone backwards a few steps since then. And this pandemic has, has pulled back the, the facade, the layer is to reveal a lot of flaws of systems and humanity. And, you know, I, I, on one hand, I feel grateful to be in Montana. And on the other hand, I feel heart sick about so many people that are going through such hardship right now. And we're seeing a huge influx of people that are coming from San Francisco, New York, Los Angeles, and cities to uh, inquire about, you know, coming to Montana permanently and moving to places like Idaho and, and Wyoming. Like, they're looking for more space. And, and on, there's a real kind of silver lining in that people are kind of re-aligning uh, themselves with the, the integrity of this living system that we're a part of as opposed to just thinking of it as such an extraction. Um, people are starting to really rethink how we can integrate and complement uh, these, you know, Mother Earth and these living systems. 
a world with borders and walls uh, would make me very sad. And it's already happening in some places, clearly. Um, but, you know, we're one, one species, one human race. And, and I, my optimistic, hopeful side uh, thinks that we may get there one day, but it's going to take a lot of work. It is. Um, can, can you maybe give me some insights or some things that you're working on or that are emerging or evolving that um, not just the sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement, but that, that you're kind of hashing out with, with Hatch or many, many of your other projects that are kind of working towards not only achieving the 2030 agenda, the sustainable development goals, but also this global citizenry, this one that where, where this current civilization framework that we have is really not working for us uh, all over the world. It's dividing us, create a, a lot of different problems, but we, we don't want to go into all those. We want to be optimistic, but maybe some things that we could be hopeful coming from your great track record of projects and events and things that you've been involved in with super fabulous people. Well, the Impact Labs is a real, I mean, post-COVID, I should say, because um, we do a lot of these things in person normally. And, and I, you know, there will never be anything that can fully substitute, you know, being face-to-face -face and being able to read people's body language and feel the energy as we're having conversations. Uh, but virtually, like the attempt that we're moving on right now is this, that first iteration of the, global, or the Impact Labs and the Global Living Rooms but the Impact Lab specifically because it's co-creating with diverse teams from different cultures and, and, and countries and so forth. And, and that framework now is something that we're looking at applying to a lot of different applications. Uh, for instance, we're working with a, a, a series of schools. There's a school in Los Angeles that we're going to use remote learning Impact Labs. It's called the Global Classroom. We have a, you know, one school in Los Angeles that's almost 100% Latin. Uh, Latinx, and then we have another school that we're working with that's almost 100% African American in Chicago, and another one that's almost 100% white in Montana. And we're, you know, now trying trying to weave some schools together and on the East Coast as well, Atlanta, New York, Philadelphia, uh, Maine. And so I can imagine these kids helping them like building teams of diversity, expanding their worldview beyond the the immediate cultures around them to co-create these solutions that can impact their backyards. And that's a really beautiful vision. And we're working hard to kind of manifest that, but we're also working to, you know, you know John Hagel, who's a member of the Hatch community, who's a longtime mentor, mentored tons of Silicon Valley CEOs and, and currently still does. Uh, Deloitte gave him his own center of research called the Center for the Edge. And I called John uh, toward the beginning of this and we had a, some, a, several conversations and I was like, John, you know, are the CEOs of these big companies, are they calling you and asking for advice? He's like, yes, they are. I'm like, well, what are they asking? And well, they ask how to get back to normal as fast as possible. I'm like, what do you tell them? He's like, not to get back to normal because that was broken and it wasn't working and that was our opportunity, right? And so I'm like, well, how do you transform institutions? And like, well, you don't, like, you transform the leaders within those institutions. Like, well, how do you do that? It's like, well, through opportunity-based narratives. I'm like, so you're saying that right now is one of the most important times in history for storytellers. And he said, yes, because if we can inspire through opportunity-based, not fear-based, but these opportunity-based narratives of what the world could look like, then, you know, these leaders within these institutions, which can steer, you know, the, a bit of the trim tab uh, within this uh, long arc of humanity, we, we stand a chance. And so... We've been working with um, a lot of regenerative thinkers, you know, Janine Banius and Bill Reed and Daniel Christian Wall. We've been having like some really fascinating conversations about how regenerative philosophies can be kind of a, taken and planted and placed over as an overlay into other systems and industries as a way in which it's not just sustainable, but it's actually giving back and, and growing uh, the ecosystem around it. So that's where a lot of our efforts have been in the last six months or five months. That's beautiful. Um, John Hagel is also a, a Kinternet uh, groupie, I guess. I don't know what the, the Kinternetter 
Um, and so I know him from there in Singularity University as well, but he's a, a fabulous, great person. And so that, that's nice to hear. And I, I know you're working on a bunch of other things. I, I, I totally agree with you and with what he says as well. Uh, during this lockdown has been the biggest, not only pause, but opportunity. My projects have tripled. I have also received calls from the CEOs and from the executive team that I've talked to in the past says, boy, we should have listened to you. We should have uh, divested and started moving towards ESG. We should have really uh, gotten on the ball. Um, we're, we're in trouble. Can you help us get back uh, up, to, up to speed and, and make some changes? And that is really something that is so important because if during this COVID-19 time, you uh, as a corporation or organization have not implemented or set an expedient schedule aside to restructure your business models, your operations, how your organization works, uh, then you are just returning to this normal. And, and the term is, and not only in the UN, but but as we know, business as usual. Business as usual is bad. It's just going back to a broken old system. Um, through the implementation of reactionary personal protection equipment, hygiene, disinfection, uh, social distancing, masks, and things, you're only ushering in a dystopian type of a future, which will continue with more reactionary measures, putting out the fires, uh, solving the problems after they've already occurred. That's a bad business model. And eventually organizations, uh, and I hate to be dramatic or, or put it out there, you know, what's the next step after mass? It'll be a gas mask, an oxygen mask, a spacesuit in order to do people's jobs and work as an organization as they actually watch these organizations crumble in front of them because those are just band-aid measures and don't actually solve the root of the problem, which is, which is so important that these, um, these organizations really need to ask themselves the, the burning question, WTF. And, and we've heard many different iterations of what WTF is, the, the swear word or whatever else, but it's what's the future. If you push the current models that that companies and organizations have been operating on uh, out into the future, you can see what, what that effect has, right? And um, we, we need to change those models. That's a Einstein's problem theory. You can't solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So Amen. I'm totally in alignment with that. And that's why I love what, what you do because you push those boundaries. You think of ways that we can grasp those plans for the future that are already in place and how we can change our thinking and shift this, this mindset. Um, I, I want to back up a little bit because it's important that our listeners uh, kind of get uh, a little bit more history about what shaped you to this place. And, and, and you and I have some similar experiences that were both strongly influenced from our mother, a uh, female figure in our life that um, for me taught me languages, taught me, showed me the world, travel, and made me a global citizen from birth and taught me resilience and many things. I believe you had a similar experience that also shaped how your views and your creativity and many things up to this point. If you don't mind, I'd love to hear and our listeners would love to hear a little bit of that story because I think it's also part of the philosophies and the, the why and the mission that's gone into Hatch and how you act and treat other people. Certainly. Um, well, yeah, I mean, my mother was definitely the first uh, example of a superhero that I remember. And she left uh, an abusive relationship with 25 cents in her pocket with me in one arm and and just said she was going to the grocery store and never looked back and ended up, you know, raising enough money, working several jobs to get a car to drive to Minneapolis where she put herself through her family's first college degree. That's where she went to undergrad. Then we moved to Bozeman, Montana, and she worked several jobs at the same time while putting herself through grad school. Every house we lived in for 
three or four years was condemned and bulldozed. And I remember in one year we, we lived in like five different houses and, you know, there was, it was just a, it was a time of a lot of uh, change and, you know, every, every couple of years, it was just something very, very different. I mean, at one point we were living in a cabin that was gifted to us from a, a, a Mormon family that actually wanted us to become Mormons. And the, the cabin had no electricity. It had no running water. We had to carry water up to the cabin. There was no glass in the windows. It was plastic windows and we had wood fire. And all of these, you know, I just remember as kind of more of like a, an adventure than really anything else. It was, I never felt sorry for myself. I do remember, you know, the, the houses that she was cleaning. I remember going into some of those homes and just thinking like, wow, this is how people can live. This is amazing. Um, and then her first teaching job, you know, she finally graduated and I was, I couldn't wait. We were, we were moving up in the world and her first teaching job was on a reservation, a Native American reservation in Northern Montana. And it was a pretty rough place. And I moved there in, in seventh and eighth grade, I moved there playing cello. Uh, and soon I realized, you know, the very first day I couldn't wait to get the last box off that truck into the house and run down these long stairs across the street to the playground where there was a couple of folks playing basketball. And I just like, like, Hey, and the ball stopped bouncing. One guy walked up to me and just punched me right in the face. And from that point forward, I, you know, they called me little custard. I was the entertainment. If I could make it home at the end of the day, uh, it was kind of a game. Uh, I could, you know, I was safe. And if I didn't make it home, they'd get up these long steps before they caught me, uh, if they did catch me, they would hold me down and I'll take turns kind of beating on me and kicking me and And it was pretty traumatic. And I remember um, I started like doing push ups and like finding rocks that I could lift weights with. And, and by the time I was leaving in eighth grade, I was on my way to be, you know, kind of shirking the world of creativity and becoming a, an athlete. I got into wrestling and, and I ran into some of these kids a couple of years later. I kept growing and, and they'd stopped growing. And, and I just remember like seeing them in the hallway and just like framing them up and just had this moment of like, wow, like I can completely eat their lunch right now. This is my time for retribution. And, and it was a real visceral moment. It was like, like just like thousands of flashcards, just, you know, images kind of moving through my mind about where hatred comes from and why they have those feelings and that they've been, put through so much injustice through the course of uh, their lifetimes and their generations, you know, before them and everything that had happened since white colonialization. And, and I just remember just like this full recognition that you can either be another link in the chain or break that part of the chain. And that uh, I'd been given this gift, you know, as a white male, um, you're already kind of given this privilege, uh, an advantage, a head start to a certain degree. And, to a large part, really. Um, I've learned a lot more about that even this year as I dug in after the George Floyd murder about systemic oppression and white supremacy. And, and But I just remember feeling that, that almost that I'd been feeling, I'd been given this gift to uh, really hone my empathy and an understanding. And I think that that experience has really informed a lot of what I've done since then, you know, really focusing on teams of diversity and and equality and and justness in the world. I've seen that in, in, in the people that I know have attended as well, but also in your past videos that you've opened up and shared of, of Hatch experiences and things that you've created that there's an extreme amount of diversity and um, uh, global citizens that are uh, coming together as a, of one mind for uh, uh, a bigger mission is almost say to how do you save the world type of a mission you know how do we hatch this this new earth this new world which is one of your slogans as well um that i, I really loved to see that i think there was one other thing in there that you uh because you had so many things that have shaped you um one, your, your mother gave you a camera, which created, you know, struck you out in a kind of a creative uh, direction as well. But also um, mentioned big brothers and big sisters to you. 
which uh, you probably uh, lacking a father figure at the time or just wanted to, uh, someone to show you and hang out with and do things with that you had some fabulous experiences that also showed you not only by being at an in, uh, all Indian school, the only white, the white boy there, um, the white person there that you you've seen these diversities and this the other side of things because it's it's kind of rare to hear your side of the story like that that we don't hear those that often we always hear the other side of the story which is beautiful to hear because uh, i've also experienced them but we need to hear these messages yeah i agree i mean i think we need to elevate as many of these messages as possible and they're they're hard to find, honestly. I mean, to you have to work to go find these messages and people who need a platform and a microphone. And like, I'll never remember, I'll never forget uh, this this young man, Royce man, uh, who's a young poet, at the age of 14, did a slam poetry contest and won in eighth grade. And it was called White Boy Privilege about being, you know, born on this, like, you know, further up the ladder and he wants to turn that ladder into a bridge and just recognizing that, that he has been given this white privilege and we brought him to Hatch. Uh, he blew everyone away. I mean, you know, was, what's interesting is that when that someone posted, it was just like shot on a phone or something. Someone posted that video and it sat there for, you know, a couple of months without any sort of movement. And suddenly some, a couple of members of a hate group got a hold of it. And they're the ones ironically enough that started kind of blowing it up. And we invited him to Hatch. He came, and his his awareness and exposure started to grow really quickly. And he called me one time. He's like, "Look, I have to ask you something. I'm feeling very uncomfortable about being the one with the microphone. Like this was not my intention. Uh, like I don't want to be, you know, the figurehead for this." And I'm like, "Well, Royce, I mean, there's been some amazing African American figureheads for this, but what you're doing is expanding the audience. Like you're bringing more people into this conversation." because there are people that are listening and like use the platform and then hand the mic off, like grow your platform and make sure that you can help elevate, you know, other people you know, of color that, that need that microphone that, that, that deserve that microphone. And so that was, I mean, a, I just had a lot of um, respect for him for feeling like that. And B he's continued to just grow that platform and working uh, BIPOC and, and, you know, LGBTQ, like he's, he's really expanded uh, that platform to really help March for Our Lives. He works really closely with, so he's a, he's a young activist and he's, a, he's going to turn into an amazing leader. He just graduated high school this year and I think he's running for school board in Atlanta. So um, that's fabulous. That's, a, that's absolutely fabulous. The, um, the, the camera probably wasn't the direct transition into that, but it was probably the spark that uh, got creativity and, and uh, some skills and, and interest in that direction. But you kind of evolved into a photograph, a photographer, and, and uh, then video, audio, direction. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that story? And it's done some amazing things like we said, P. Diddy and, and Virgin and, and, and many others, uh, uh, give us a little teaser, a little experience on that journey and how, how that evolved and progressed and how you've nicely combined it with your work at Hatch and, and other things to kind of make it a movement of positivity. Certainly. Uh, when I was in third or fourth grade, I can't exactly remember, uh, but my mom gave me a present and it was a camera. And at that time, like we had zero money. We had, you know, people were dropping food baskets on our door. And so I was really touched by the fact that, that you know, it looked expensive and I don't really know if it was or not, but the camera changed my life. And it's because we were sitting on the steps one morning and a neighbor came by and asked if they could take our photograph. And I remember just like looking at that camera, just like, wonder how that works exactly. Like how, what are the mechanics behind it? And she saw my, you know, curiosity. And when that camera arrived in my, in my hands, uh, I just started taking it everywhere with me. Uh, you know, shots of the school walking cross guard and uh, just the shortcuts to, to, you know, where she would go to school and so forth. I spent a lot of time by myself and um, roaming around with that camera and it became a, a vessel 
for um, imagination and and really trying you know like seeing things that other people don't necessarily see if they're not stopping to really look at you know I do this a lot because like now I do it not just with my hand but just like zoom in on stuff if you're kind of like you know you can dissect the world around you into small pieces and all these little details exist and and it's fascinating. I've been carrying a camera my whole life ever since. And it was my goal, my dream to become a filmmaker. I went to film school. Actually, that's not entirely true. It was my goal to become a filmmaker until I wanted to, you know, my mom became the, the an art teacher. And then I wanted to do everything opposite of creativity. Uh, and, you know, what, I got a college and football wrestling scholarship. And, for, you know, two years in, you know, I'm, uh, you know, we did really well in nationals and wrestling and so forth, but I just realized like it wasn't really my game. Um, I was I was an artist, and so I had to kind of come to terms with that, and left that school, went to a different school, enrolled in film school at Montana State University, uh, which was you know highly ranked, highly respected film school, and started a production company, um, started telling stories, went to Los Angeles. I was now a director. I was bound and determined to be a director. Like I was going to do nothing less than direct. And after starving in Los Angeles for four months, pretty soon I was on set as a production assistant, which is kind of the lowest person on the totem pole. You're getting coffee and taking out the trash, but I was still <laughs> carrying my camera with me. And, and so even while, you know, I was running around, taking the trash and doing errands and so forth, I was taking photographs of the different crew members. And then later I would have it printed and like pass out these photos of people doing their work. And it got the attention of a couple of people. Uh, Michael Bay, I worked on several of his sets for a while. And, and at one point, um, you know, it came to me, he's like, look, you got to go do your own thing. Uh, you know, you're fired. I'm like, what? I'm like, one of the best PAs you have. And, and he supported me going to follow my dream as a director. And it was not that long after that, that I was you know, I was on a, uh, the set with Bone Thugs and Harmony, who had just won a Grammy for, uh, for this music video that we were doing uh, for the Batman movie that just came out. And so I'm like, on top of a skyscraper in downtown Los Angeles with the bat plane and, and the Batmobile down, down below. And it just, it, it was all very surreal. Um, and, you know, telling those stories in, in a really meaningful way. And then I started my own production company when I came back to Montana. Uh, Hatch was 100% volunteer driven for, you know, over a decade. And so I would have to make my living still as a filmmaker. And the, the, we made a real commitment to sculpt stories that make a difference. And, and so that, you know, but still even then, I, I, toward the end, I just felt like all I could think about was Hatch when I was even on a film set. And at that point, I realized it was no longer my dream to be a director, that I should be supporting other people who have creative visions and dreams and that I really wanted to just focus on impact. And creativity is a critical part of solving the, the mess that we found ourselves in right now. It's, you know, I have kind of a thesis that the business world stole the word creativity and repackaged it as innovation because it's more fundable. And yet as all these different uh, music classes and arts classes are being cut, like we're, we're going to like lose creativity. And if we lose creativity, there's no more new ideas. We're stuck with everything that's already in a textbook and there's no more progress. There's no more uh, solving of the problems that we've found ourselves in, which requires creative thinking. So I think it's one of the most important ingredients that, that we, we look for, we cultivate uh, the people that we curate and bring together for Hatch. I'm always trying to find those that you may, you may be in tech or finance or the business world, but if you have a little bit of a creative vent, now you can, uh, ideate and and think of things that that you know previously didn't exist. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, uh, numerous examples of big creative movements. Uh, Bob Geldof and uh, Band Aid Live Aid, you know, three billion people watching him live and his concerts, and uh, the not only the creativity, the amount of help and the amount of monies that that can be raised but also the amount of political influence that you can have out of creating an, just a simple event like that where you could call up, which he did, uh, call up uh, Margaret Thatcher and say, you know, I've got three billion people watching us live and, and I've got your phone number, obviously. I can obviously give that to about 500 million of them and have them call you to make some political changes. And, 
and what happens in the future. And, you know, and then there's other organizations like Global Citizens and My Catch and, and that I, I truly believe that that creativity is so important. There's a little bit of a rabbit hole that you opened up that I'd like to poke our heads down and maybe get into a little bit deeper. deeper. I have this strong feeling that a lot of the past 10, 15 years, um, media has not truly improved in many ways. We have more dystopian movies, more dystopian type of um, doom and gloom, you know, whether it's Waterworld, Total Recall, or, or um, Apocalypse, or Zombies, or whatever it is, it's us fighting over something in the future, water resources against each other. It's very dark, uh, not a lot to be hopeful for. From our generation, when we were younger and, and uh, didn't watch a lot of TV back then, but Star Trek and, and some of those were more sci-fi showing interracial couples and genders and no smoking sets and and you know these tricorders and hollow rooms and all these cool things transporters uh, that we could even though it was sci-fi we could engineer create architects could build it we could try to figure out how to make that reality even though at that time it was movie magic and that's what we've done today there's not a lot of beautiful whether it's utopian or not images of a, of a resilient desirable future even 2030 we don't have any visions what what does the world look like and what can we engineer and create and, and try to strive for that's only dystopian and maybe i'm over generalizing um but as someone who's a creative a director and and a, you still produce not only events but uh obviously videos and have have teams that pull things together do you think if we had some tv series some some media out there that was like really showing us a beautiful vision of what it would be like if we reached the Paris Agreement and all the uh, the Sustainable Development Goals and what that future would look like, would feel like, and we could see it a little bit that we would maybe work harder to try to to reach it, to engineer for it. Yeah, I truly believe that there is uh, an opportunity to to co-design, co-create, and manifest a desirable future, and it's something that we've had a considerable amount of conversations with. NASA and JPL and, and some other folks within the Hatch Network. Uh, there's a good friend of mine who's part of the Hatch Network named uh, Mark Gurner. And he used to work in Hollywood with James Cameron and on, you know, Avatar and X-Men and uh, Superman and like, like envisioning as an illustrator, like a really beautifully, like he's an amazing artist, but always envisioning these futures. And, he, and after over time, uh, they're all dystopian and it started kind of wearing on him and he decided to shift gears um, partially inspired by his coming to hatch and put those creative uh, aspirate or, or creative talents to use in manifesting a more desirable future. He started a company called EcoGo, which is a transparency engine that helps you identify which project or products that you can buy in the marketplace um, have uh, do, do less, the least amount of harm to the planet and people but also help inform companies to improve their EQ score to um, you know, supply chain all the way to delivery to market. Um, and you know, recently we had, what's interesting is when the, you know, Star Trek was such a beautiful vision. Um, and you know, now when, when, this, when the, there was a charter that was written uh, in the seventies that, that stated basically that no country can own a piece of the moon or space uh, yet, they didn't anticipate that the future of space would be private, right? So Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Richard Branson, that uh, the charter does not state that a person or company cannot own a piece of the moon in space. And the moon is now looking like it's ripe for minerals and mining and extraction. And so we, uh, I was invited to this round table at, at NASA uh, to, to, to really think about if you could start from scratch, like what is the, the manifesto for humanity if you're kind of building from the ground up, like really an opportunity to restructure the thinking around 
a lot of different uh, ways in which our humanity is kind of flawed right now. Where do we, where do we build it into a more desirable future? And I think that, you, you know, Harold Neidhart also from yeah. internet, and he has a really great company called Future IO about uh, moonshots for desirable futures. Um, I have a great deal of respect for the work that he's doing. And, you know, ultimately, you know, the, the pr one of the projects that we're working on or that we've discussed with uh, David Delgado at JPL is working with youth and bringing in uh, illustrators and conceptual artists and storytellers and filmmakers to co-create and manifest these desirable futures in a real tangible way, in a storytelling way. And that project really excites me. And I think that we can do it even now, you know, during COVID virtually with one of these impact labs uh, methodologies around the, um, you know, manifesting, like designing and, and defining uh, the desirable future that we'd like to manifest. But if that translated into a modern day piece of media, a television show to your earlier question, I think that would be really beautiful. Uh, we're, we're, we're light on inspirational content these days. Yeah, I think we have plenty of documentaries, but during this time of lockdown, you know, all the Netflix have gone up like crazy, all the streaming. So whether it's Amazon Prime or Disney Plus or whoever it is, has just went up. But the, the type of non-dystopian content or documentaries that uh, usually not all doctor documentaries are that uh, non-dystopian either. They're usually showing what's bad in our world and how, that, how we need to get active and fix it. Um, it's just really lacking. And I think that would be a nice big push if every single week there was at least one TV series that was guaranteed to be there every single week that showed us a different version of what the future would be. And, uh, you know, however that is, whether it's electric vehicles and totally renewable and, and you know, breathable clean air, and we've started living within the planetary boundaries and, and reconnecting cities with nature more, um, also, you know, you and I are, are probably fans of, uh, uh, of uh, Carl Sagan and some of his wise words, and not just the pale blue dot, but about yeah, cities we, and the future. We yeah. humans are capable of extraordinary things, is one yeah. of my favorite pieces from Carl Sagan. Yeah, and, yeah. and, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with like Paul Hawken and yeah. Amanda Joy Ravenhill's uh, work with Project Drawdown, but I would love to see you know, these outputs of Project Drawdown on things that we as humans can do on a daily, weekly basis tethered into a piece of media so that that piece of media, if it was a series that happened every week, has the call to action and a website that you can go to, to really like create a really simple roadmap on how you can, I mean, you know, one of my favorite kind of personal mantras is, is how do you save the world? Start with where you are. And that doesn't necessarily always just mean your backyard and community. It also means inside. And so, human transformation and mindfulness that matriculates out to your backyard. And if everyone was, you know, ha hatch a better world, you have to hatch your best self. If we were spending more time in thoughtful, mindful practices, um, but also really had a roadmap for the, the youth on how they can impact their backyards, which was one of the you know components of the earlier uh, social network that we started from 99 to 2003, you know, gamifying uh, community interaction and, and impact. Like I would love to see that come back to in play again. I would too. That that would be a beautiful thing. I think we've gone down that rabbit hole enough, and and we'll let let's keep shouting that uh, and try to take part in those. I, I'm trying to work with a, a few organizations and groups to pull together a team that maybe could realize some kind of a a series or or something that 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 gets pushed forward in the future. But I would love to see that. That leads me to my um, very first hardest question that, uh, you know, I, I kind of touched upon in the beginning, and it's the burning question, WTF, not what the fuck, but what's the future? And I want to know, what's the future for you, Yarrow? Do you have a vision or a pretty good picture of where we could be? There's a lot of different outcomes, right? I mean, there's a lot of different things that can happen. Um, uh, when I hear... WTF, what's the future? I also think of we the future. And that's a project that that we're working on together. You, myself, Laura yeah. Stein, uh, kind of leading the helm on that. Uh, Laura is an amazing human being that uh, launched and started the TEDx's and the Women's Global March and 
and now has BOMA Global. And this idea of bringing together a network of networks as a we to encompass um, all of the different possibilities for these desirable outcomes in the future. Uh, right now, you know, it's one of the things that I've been um, really just I've loved seeing in COVID is that I'm part of like several of these network of networks conversations right now with people that are leading their own communities and and amazing, you know, kind of impactful uh, organizations, but they're all, you know, a lot of us are coming together and having more collective conversations on how we can link arms and link communities and, and start to move the needle at a faster pace, which is, you know, honestly, why I, I launched the, the H360 AI platform is it's to power communities and then link them together in a way that they can share a database of impact projects and, and, and uh, nonprofits that are doing important work in the world and also mobilize employee engagement for large enterprise companies and you know the AI and the, match, the machine learning match makes people to their projects of interest so that we can really start mobilizing. Uh, I, mean, I mean imagine just having a, a central database where you're able to see all of the SDGs number three, number 10, number 11, stacking those and seeing where there's redundancies and duplication of efforts where there's uh, opportunity for collaborations like oh like Mark you should be working with Harold on this boom the, the AI can just like bring us a cue of those projects that we want to accelerate so um, and then let's see we the future what's the future um, so recently on the global living room we had Michelle Thaler who's this incredible uh, astronomer from NASA and she's also the chief communications officer for Goddard Space Center and she's a beautiful storyteller, but an amazing data scientist. NASA just released, uh, like a month and a half ago or so, uh, a data set that was fairly um, humbling and scary. And the two to four foot ocean rise that we've all been kind of hearing about and projected over the next 150 to 200 years, uh, that's been moved up because the just even from the carbon that's already been released it's like no more carbon got released already been released this particular data set that nasa released shows that two to four foot ocean rise will happen within the lifetime of our children before the end of the century so the next 65 to 75 years we're going to see two to four foot ocean rise and when you and when michelle shows that map of what's currently inhabited on the planet shrinking but all the coasts and all the islands, like by 25%, billions of people will be displaced and migrate. And suddenly, those of us in the U.S. who think about, you know, immigrants and refugees as something that happens somewhere else, we're all going to become impacted and affected uh, by the billions. And then, of course, there's going to be resource wars over water and minerals and, and land and nutrients. And so, like, there has to be a full court press. Another friend of mine, David McConville, who was a you know worked with the he was the president of the Buckminster Fuller Institute for many years he's a, he's a really brilliant scientist uh, I mean he moved from Asheville North Carolina to the Bay Area uh, five or six years ago and I flew down to you know he loved nature and obviously still loves nature but I flew down to San Francisco and Oakland had a had a beer with him asked him why he moved and he flipped over this nap he drew these six lines he like if this 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 isn't reversed not just like mitigated, but reversed in the next 18 to 19 years, we've passed the point of no return. And I'm like, did you say 80 to 90 years? Like, no, 18 to 19 years. I moved here to accelerate my work because here is a place where work can get accelerated. And I was like, holy shit, eight to nine years. And that's, that was like six or seven years ago. And so on the plane ride home, I'm, you know, wondering to myself, am I being selfish by being tucked away up in here in Montana? Should I like re-engage into an urban community again? Should I go back to Los Angeles or San Francisco to help, you know, take lunch meetings every single day? And, and I really considered it. I actually made my mind up to move back and then started thinking about um, how focused I am when I'm in nature. And like, I can go to a city and see a bunch of the people that are in my communities and tribes and, and do lots of meetings and then get back on a plane and come back and just be very centered in Montana. Um, but what's interesting, like we, it's an all hands on deck moment in time in this race between consciousness and catastrophe. If we don't start to, to elevate these regenerative philosophies and implement those into multiple domains and business practices, 
uh, we are going to lose out on our opportunity for these more desirable outcomes. That's absolutely uh, certain and that's so true. This year, this decade of action was a release of many different data sets, not just from NASA, that are disheartening. You've, you've probably heard it before that by 2050, uh, all the, there'll be more plastic in the oceans than fish. That's been moved up to 2040. So um, what, what humanity is really missing the boat on is understanding the exponential function. That's something that Singularity deals, uh, University deals with and, and uh, Peter Diamandis and, and many others in our circle who understand really well how the exponential function works. The other thing is most people don't realize that uh, the, the United Nations uh, FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, said in 2015, we have 50 more harvests left of traditional agriculture. We have 50 harvests left. So now we've got 45 left, 45 harvests left in traditional agriculture methods that are causing deforestation, soil degradation, uh, pesticides that are not using regenerative permaculture, no-till practices to save our soils, to reduce deforestation and things like that. So um, that and many other horrifying or dystopian type of statistics we can release, there's this problem. If, if there's a bear or a lion or a dinosaur, T-Rex, whatever it is, uh, in front of a human being, we tend to say, oh my gosh, fight or flight, and we've got to do something and react. But when a statistic, a graph, a data set is thrown in front of us, we're going to, what we tend to react a little bit differently is say, oh, that's a data set. Oh, that's a graph. Or that that's a, a temperature timeline or ice core data sampling. And we don't put it into an ex existential threat. And we also, it's so big, we're like, how do you deal with that? It's such a huge problem. How do you tackle that? And I and think, well, yeah, go ahead. Well, and, and st I think storytelling really has a lot to do with that. You look at documentaries like The Cove uh, that have like massive legislative outcomes for that. And like, you know, another uh, dear friend and, and Hatcher runs a company called Soul Buffalo, Dave Ford, he put together an incredible uh, initiative last year that we helped co-curate and, and kind of produce some, some lab sprints on that boat. It was Ocean Plastics Leadership Summit. And we had 250, uh, $250 billion of aggregate revenue between, you know, some of the largest creators of plastics in the world, Nestle, Dow, along with some historically adversarial relationships, Greenpeace, Ocean Conservancy, World Wildlife Fund, all on a boat out in the Sargasm Sea at the site of one of the largest plastic gyres uh, you know, in the world. And these like business leaders and NGOs coming together to work on solving ocean plastics, it was humbling to see and transformative because people that thought they were doing a lot to, to improve the situation, like, are in tears, like recognizing that we have to like really push push the pedal down in the middle. So uh, Dave has created the Ocean Plastics Leadership Network right now that has an, that I'm the advisory board for, and there's a really great group of brands that have come on. Uh, so there are these you know pieces of hope, but those stories need to be amplified and elevated out into the press. We need you know magazines like Fast Company and Forbes and, you know, newspapers like the Wall Street Journal and, and the Atlantic, like to really start to elevate these stories of hope because that creates, like, you know, there's a beautiful Jane Goodall quote, like, you know, thousands of years from now, we'll look back at a species called the human race, you know, very similar to what that species will have evolved into and just wonder like, how could we let all of this happen? How could we let all of these other species die and, and just crumble within the, the construct of this planet Earth. And yet there's still so much worth fighting for. And if we fall into hopelessness and apathy, we're done. Like we, we have to, to tether into hope and that's done through, you know, these opportunity-based narratives and inspiring storytelling. So it it's really is a time to elevate the stories, but the media needs to be able to grab those and help push them out to the rest of the world. 
I, I totally am in alignment. We need more of these stories because the more we have them, and it's kind of like you, you've surrounded yourself with fabulous people with Hatch and try to find not only the diversity, but people who are on a mission to, to save the world, to make the planet a better place, to, to, to leave our home better than we found it, not only uh, for us, but for our future generations, multiple generations. And um, that kind of ties to, to two things. Uh, one, the golden rule, treat people and planet how you'd like to be treated, but also to leave it better than we found it. Um, the second thing is that we don't get, a, get or understand a lot. And, I don't, and by no means with this analogy or this example, do I want to be dystopian or negative, but a lot of corporations, a lot of organizations good, bad, or ugly, who might have been on that ship or, or might have or be doing something else negative in the world, they come out with these annual reports. And in those annual reports, they say, this year, we're going to go reduce our carbon or greenhouse gas emissions 70%, 80%. By 2030, we're going to go plastic-free, no more plastic. They come out with these reports. But what they're telling us one is absolutely nothing. They're telling us that they're going slower in the wrong direction. They're still doing harm. They're still polluting. They're just doing it a lot slower. And people say, well, at least they're doing something. They've got, they've got to do something and you're being too hard and, and, and every, any corporation can come back. I agree. Any corporation can come back and do the right thing. The problem that we don't understand, and this is a story that needs to be told in a very positive and, and uplifting way, is if the entire world were to stop today, absolutely stop, reverse our direction, and go in the right direction, I promise you that poof, all the plastic emissions, all the greenhouse gas emissions, all the pollution that we put into our our planet historical emissions do not disappear just like that hmm. and so somebody's left for that cleanup so as a corporation as an organization as an ngo as a consumer we actually need to go in the positive direction and clean that up and there are organizations um, i can't think of the young gentleman's name a university student who create created these super system for cleaning up our waterways with this boat that- Boy and Slap? Boy and Slap, yep. Yeah, and so um, fabulous projects like that and numerous others coming on board every single day that we have the will and we can hit that exponential function. We just need to get the stories and that positive narrative out there. Um, I, I know you have to go. We don't have that much time. I've got two more questions for you, and then we'll say goodbye. The, the, this is the last hardest question I have for you, and you might have already answered it in one way or the other. It's a little bit of a twist. What does a world that works for absolutely every human being look like for you? What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Well, that's a beautiful question. I mean, my, the first thing that comes to my mind is that everyone has a seat at the table uh, where these discussions are happening, where these decisions are being made. Um, I'm on plenty of calls where everyone's, you know, talking about BIPOC and yet there's no one that's on, the, on that call that's of color. And it's like, like, we can't have conversations for other people. They need to be at the table. And so, you know, thankfully, like the Black Lives Matter movement that's happening right now across the, the US um, is is retooling some of the boardrooms and and some of the, the the company leadership and so we're you know we're moving in the right direction but I mean the one first thing is like everyone needs to sit at the table um, you know, how can we solve for the migration and displacement of you know the indigenous islanders in the Pacific uh, because of you know, this two to four foot ocean rise and climate change, if we're not having those discussions with those people at the table as well. It's like, and second, I mean, you know, this can start to, <laughs> you know, in, the, in our conversation with Janine Banyas from the Biomimicry Institute, 
uh, she references, you know, any, any problem that we're looking for a solution for can be found in nature. And nature is very much a collaborative mycelial behavioral system. It's like one living system and we are a part of that system. And, uh, you know, unfortunately we treat that system as if we are the kind of owners or rightful uh, extractors of that system, but we're not. And every once in a while we're slapped down and, and humbled uh, by nature, just through its mighty uh, voice and, and these like major storms, now a global pandemic, um, we're being given these reminders that are not that subtle, uh, but some people choose not to read into those as real reminders that we're not in balance with nature right now. So, not, you know, I think the second part would be that we are in balance with nature, this one living system, and that we treat each other as nature does. Uh, in, a, in a form of collaboration and mycelium, um, like the mycelial network is just so fascinating. We have, you know, thousands of miles of forests that are connected by one underground mushroom fungi. And if there's a sick tree in the forest, like other trees are sending it nutrients and, there's, and they're receiving it back. They're exchanging wisdom and in intelligence through these neural networks underground. Like there's a lot to be learned from nature. And so I would, that's where I would look. I, you know, in terms of what that, looks like or is how it's designed i would just really uh reference nature for that yeah that, that uh, mycelium and this mycorrhiza this network under uh, underground um the beginnings of, of life uh, are really um right in nature and we are star stuff like carl sagan says and we're part of this earth we're made up of the same elements and um full alignment that was another powerful woman as well where she got that information from lynn margulis who was carl sagan's first wife and um so that that's where that comes from she's the biggest scientist ever who discovered that i have There's also just yeah, one last reference on that michelle thaler who i like so much respect for the astronomer yeah. from nasa has a, sh a very short video called we are dead stars and it breaks it down in a really, uh, really short and, and, and poetic way. So I would, I would recommend that as well. I, I need to watch that. Absolutely watch it. Uh, uh, matter of fact, I had uh, Carl Sagan's daughter on the show just a couple of days ago, Sasha Sagan. She was uh, 14 when he passed away, sadly. But uh, she's also written a book and I had her on the show. So I really believe that uh, our world would draw down, as Paul Hawkins says, if we had more empowered women and girls with their great wisdom, their great knowledge, and uh, to depart that to humanity and the stories that we've been talking, these narratives that need to come out, that people need to know these fabulous women uh, existed and what they brought to our world and an understanding of how we can better become part of a symbiotic earth, which is essentially what you're saying. My last uh, question is more not a question. I would, Mark, yeah, yeah. Before you move on from that, I just sure. want to point out there was a study that came out recently about how the different countries responded to COVID. And those countries that were led by women had the most thoughtful responses and the most successful outcomes. And I can't wait until our country is led by a woman. I mean, we, we definitely need more feminine energy uh, in boardrooms and in, in places of leadership across the planet. Yeah, my mother was the best leader you could ever imagine and uh, shaped who I am and uh, was not only my best friend, but my best mentor. And I tell you that whether it's my grandmother or any other woman in my life or that I've read about or admire have uh, really shaped me uh, tremendously. So yeah, and our, the board of Hatch is, is uh, majority women and and I'm, I'm just so grateful that, to have that wisdom uh, helping drive our own initiatives and mission. My, my last uh, ask for you is actually, I would like to see if you could give a sustainable takeaway, a tool, a tip, something of empowerment that would help the innovators, the entrepreneurs, the creatives that are listening to make their life better, to feel more empowered, something that they could put into their toolbox or quote or wisdom that would, that would say, wow, I need to go to 
to hatch or uh, that word of wisdom that he gave for me for free is something that uh, has really helped me move forward or I've had that aha moment now because of it. Well, it kind of makes me think of the, the, the core tenets of Hatch. We have this, the tenets of the culture of Hatch. And one is to be for each other, to, to really, by default, be for each other, to listen deeply and authentically, uh, to offer full heart, to offer full praise. Uh, so, you know, people, not, not often enough, I think we, there's a fairly competitive atmosphere in the world and to just really um, offer generous praise and support for people uh, makes a huge difference. And just to ask how you can be of service. So uh, all of those things and, and keep commitments, you know, accountability. Uh, one of the things we say at Hatch is you're going to get excited. You're going to get inspired. You're going to start saying, I can help you with this, this, and this. But when you start to think about your bandwidth on Monday and what you're actually capable of following through on, if you can only make two promises that you can keep, then, then save them up, make them count and keep your commitments. But I think more to the, your question, you know, Drawdown has some great um, ways in which you can make a difference on kind of a sustainable planet. Um, and then really, you know, looking in your own backyard. I mean, I think if we all look within our own communities and how we can engage in our own communities, and then, you know, one of the flaws that was revealed during this global pandemic is just how broken and kind of a centralized governmental system is if it were hyper-localized and distributed and everyone was able to really just kind of respond within their own communities and like old, you know, like the old times, you know, just villages of people that would, uh, you know, work on each other's gardens with each other and, and uh, become more sustainable together in these many, many microcosms. Um, all of those would be a, a real step in the right direction. But you know, asking how you could be of service to your own community is, I think, probably a really good place to start. I love that. And uh, it actually ties again to Lynn Margulis. Um, she, she had a saying and actually contradicted what the major science for many, many decades had thought as that uh, neoliberalism, neo-Darwinism. It just does not exist. There is no survival of the fittest. Only the strong survive. Natural selection. That's not how our world works. Our world works in, in cooperation and collaboration with each other that we help solve this because we are all members on Spaceship Earth, crew members, none of us are passengers. With that, I, I have to say goodbye. I know you have another meeting and thank you so much. Thank you, Yarrow, for being on the show. It's my pleasure. And I hope our paths cross very, very soon and that we can collaborate many times yeah me too mark i have a lot of honor for what you're doing thank you for elevating these stories out into the world uh keep it up let me know how i can help and i hope to see you in person soon if not online and much love hatch a better world talk well, soon well, you bet we'll, we'll we'll be on a couple projects together for sure so we'll see each other soon take care <coughs> bye bye boom bye brother <laughs>